Tonight I want to go through the Epistle of Jude. The Epistle of Jude. So Jude is all the way at the end of your Bible. Um, you, you, you know, if you've read through your Bible, you, you'll know where it is, but it's, I don't think it's a very familiar book to people that haven't read their Bible um, because there are epistles in the New Testament that are just like one chapter. You know, you've got Philemon, Jude, you know, you've got Second and Third John as well. Um, these just these small books, but you, you find that these little epistles are just, especially Jude, is just packed full of so much because there's all these Old Testament examples used in Jude. So I'm just going to talk through it today um, and, and, and give you some thoughts as we go through. Now, first of all, if you don't know who Jude is, if you don't know who Jude is, uh, Jude was actually one of the half-brothers of Jesus, right? He's actually one of the half-brothers of Jesus. And how do we know that? Uh, well, in Galatians 1, when Paul talks about his trip to Jerusalem, when he sees the apostles, when it, there was a dispute about whether circumcision should be included in salvation or not, and obviously it's not because salvation is just by grace through faith, but he says here, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Right? So Jesus had more than one brother. He had a few half-brothers, right? Because God was his father, uh, his, his actual father, because he didn't have an earthly father. He was born of the Virgin Mary. But then Mary then had children with Joseph, right? So Jesus was her firstborn son, and then she had other children. How do we know this? Because in Mark and in Matthew as well in the Gospels, we're actually given the names of his brothers, but not all of his sisters, right? So it says here in Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? So this is talking about Jesus Christ, the brother of James. So that's the James that's mentioned in Galatians, James, the Lord's brother, and Joseph and of Judah. So this is the Jude that wrote the epistle of Jude. Um, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us, and they were offended at him. So this is how the, the, the epistle of Jude starts. It starts off with Jude introducing himself, and this is how we know that he's one of the brothers, one of the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So you remember in Mark 6, verse 3, this is how we know who Jude is. So we can see here James and Jude, James was the Lord's brother, and we have Jude, who's the brother of James. So that's who Jude is. So we're going to go through this chapter, and really what this chapter is about, if you've read it before, it's really about Jude getting us to contend for the faith, right? So Jude is exhorting us, hey, there are going to be evil and wicked people in the world who are going to be fighting against the truth. Right? And that's what he's warning about in this epistle. These are the types of people that are going to be fighting against the faith. And you not only need to be saved, right? the common salvation, but we also need to contend. We need to, we need to be involved in this spiritual battle and know the sort of enemy that we're up against. That's what this epistle is about. So it starts off in uh, verse 1. Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, it's interesting that he's the half-brother of, of Jesus. And even Paul, when referring to James, as the Lord's brother. But I think it's interesting that Jude introduces himself not as the Lord's brother, as the brother of Jesus. Because what? Because first and foremost, he's not Jesus' brother. First and foremost, he's Jesus' servant, right? Same with us, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. Yes, we're friends of Jesus Christ. But for, first and foremost, like we serve the Lord Jesus Christ as well, right? We're servants, um, as well as sons. Well, here I find it interesting that he mentions, always mentions servant of Jesus Christ before the fact that he's James's brother. So he's a servant before he recognizes his, his duty to God, before he recognizes his physical relationship with his, his brothers that were born of Mary and Joseph. To them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. So there's always these introductions in these epistles. And what he's calling out to here, the fact that we're separated by God the Father and we're preserved in Jesus Christ. And that's one thing that the, that the Calvinists have wrong, right? Because their last point of Calvinism is perseverance of the saints. Whereas I like to think of it more as 
preservation of the saints because we don't persevere in the faith to keep our salvation. We're not saved eternally and know we have eternal security because of our perseverance. No, no, we know we have eternal life because of what Jesus does. Jesus preserves us. And that's what he's calling out to in verse number one. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, verse three is where Jude gives the purpose of why he's writing to the people he's writing to him. He's, he's writing to a group of Christians, right? Because you'll notice throughout this epistle when he says, I gave all diligence to write unto you. Now in the King James Bible, that's why there's thee, thou, and you. Because you, you know here, he is addressing a group of people. He's not just writing to an individual, right? Whereas, you know, when Paul is writing to Philemon, he's writing to an individual, right? Whereas here, he's actually addressing this letter to a, to a group of people. And this is how you know this. So he's talking to a group. He's not just talking to one person in this epistle. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, hey, he thought about writing to them just about teaching them about salvation, the common salvation, which is we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But he's saying, hey, when he gave all diligence, when he sat down to think about writing to them about the common salvation, he thought, hey, you know what? It, it's not just enough for me to teach them doctrine, teach them about salvation. It was needful for me, for me to write unto them and exhort them that they should contend for the faith. So what is the Bible saying here? The Bible saying here, hey, it's not just enough to be saved. Right? It's like it's not just enough to know that you're going to heaven. You need to earnestly contend for the faith. You need to be in the fight. Right? Too many Christians are not in the fight. Right? Are they saved? Yes. Do you need to be in the fight to be saved? Of course not. Are you going to lose your salvation if you get out of the fight? No, because salvation's eternally secure. But too many Christians, and we know them, right? Because they're all over the place, right? Because there's a lot of people that are saved but they're not in the fight. And this is what Jude is saying here, that, hey, it's needful for me to write unto you and exhort you not just about salvation, not just about, yeah, we're saved, it's great that we're saved, it's great that we're going to heaven. He's saying, no, you have to contend. You have to fight in this faith, right? Because there is a war going on. There is a spiritual war going on and too many people are, you know, missing in the battle. You know? And that's why we're losing the fight. That's why we lose the fight in this world, not because the world is just ungodly. You know, oftentimes it's just Christians aren't doing anything. Christians are too busy, taken away with their own things. And this is why he's saying hey, it's needful that he writes unto us and exhorts us that we contend for the faith. So we need to fight. There is a fight going on. 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul writes here, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So you see the thou there because First Timothy is actually written to a, a, a one person, right? So it's written to Timothy, but we get some insight there. We get to read this personal letter and learn some things. And he's exhorting Timothy there, hey, you need to fight this fight of faith. And this is not a physical fight, obviously, right? We know that. Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? So we're not like the Muslims. They actually take up arms. We're not trying to build up an armory and establish a nation and, and fight this physical war. No, we fight a spiritual war. And a spiritual war is one of the mind. It's one of words. That's why when we preach the gospel, we're going out preaching the gospel to people. We're trying to explain people truths from the Bible. You're engaging in that spiritual war, right? That's why, you know, it's like Alex Jones' chat. I think he's got a great like, brand name, right? Info Wars, you know, the battle of the mind. That's what the spiritual battle is. It's a battle of the mind. That's why Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Because words is how we wrestle, uh, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, this is what's interesting about the armor of God. 
up until we get to the end here, it's all defensive materials, these, these things that we do in our spiritual life. Stand, therefore, having your loins, right, girt about with truth. So this is your belt, right? Having on the breastplate of righteousness. So you see how there are spiritual characteristics that, have, that are likened to physical armor. And your sh feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And they all mean something. I'm not going to go through it here in this sermon because I'm not sort of preaching through this, but you know, they all mean something. Why is your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Because you're meant to be moving. You're meant to be going. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Right? So the fact that you have faith is what allows you to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Right? So up until this point, these are all defensive materials. But look at what our attacking material is, what our attacking weapon is, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Right? So you see there in the armor, everything is defensive. Up until you get to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Bible, that's your attacking weapon. Now you can't win a battle if you've got nothing to attack with. If you're only defending, right, you're never going to win. So when we fight in this spiritual fight, you need to know your Bible. Right? So not only do you need to be saved, you need to be engaged in this fight. Now if you want to actually win and be effective in this fight, you actually have to know the Bible. And that's why somebody, they don't know the Bible. They go out there, they just get slaughtered, right? Because they got nothing to actually fight back with. Yeah, your faith might say, oh, you know, you, you can say all these things about my faith and you can mock Christianity and I'll still believe it. But we need to get past that. We need to get past where people just think Christians are just, ah, oh, yeah, but you just believe that because you're just blindly believing. Because like, I just believe it doesn't matter about all these objections. We can fight back if we know the Bible. If we know what we're talking about, we can fight back and we can actually win and, and turn the tide in this spiritual battle. And of course, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we have all the defensive equipment, then we have our sword, and then we need God's power, right? That's why prayer is necessary as well to win this spiritual fight. So let's go on. So that's what he's, Jude's saying in verse 3. He's saying, hey, you know, you need to earnestly contend for faith. You need to get in this fight. And now he's going to talk about who our enemy is, right? Who these wicked and ungodly people are. Now, a lot of people, you know, they think that Jude is only talking about the, you know, the reprobate sodomites, right? The reprobate homosexuals. No, no, no. I think that they're included in this book, right? Because they're part of the wicked people as well. But not every wicked person is a homosexual. Right? There are wicked people that aren't homosexual too. You know, you have like rabid atheists that hate God and they're out there just to destroy, you know, Christianity. Um, you know, just people that are, you know, it's, it, that's why I just don't want you to get this idea that when you read through this, it's just talking about one specific group of people because there are evil people that are out to destroy God from all different angles, right? That have all different, you know, you know different types of fornication, right? And, you know, thank God, you know, we don't mix with a lot of these people, but... You know, in the world, you know, you, you get out there, it's a jungle out there. You know, I don't even want to know sometimes. You know, I used to work in a, in a restaurant and the sort of stories that I would hear. I mean, I don't, mean, I don't work with people like that anymore. But, you know, the things that I would tell, I just say, I don't even know, like, if I would ever mix in those circles. I would never want to. But there, it's out there. You know, if you, you know, look hard enough, it's out there, right? This, this, uh, this, this is really ungodly stuff, which is what Jude is warning people about. Well, he says here, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there's a few things I want to mention in here. So... There is a warning here that these ungodly men as well are going to try and creep into Christianity. 
Now, they don't necessarily, you know, creep into this church, right? Because, you know, churches that are preaching the truth and, and know the right thing, they, they get exposed really quickly. They don't really want to be around churches like this. But in terms, if you think of Christianity as a whole, this is what these ungodly people, they creep into. They creep into these circles and they try and set up churches of their own. I mean, last week I was speaking to uh, uh, a Samo I think she was a Samoan girl. She goes to a uniting church and now they're having discussions about, you know, whether to ordain homosexual ministers and whether they're going to welcome them into the church and things like that. And like I said, homosexuality is not the only example that Jude is talking about, but this is one of the things he's warning about. He's warning about these wicked people that go against God's word, that don't care about what God has in terms of holiness and spirituality, and then they set themselves up as a spiritual mentor. You, know, you see it on Q&A all the time, you know, Q&A. You know, uh, Q and A, they, they get like a panel talking about like marriage or talking about Christianity, and there's always like some homosexual minister on there, and you're just like, or some some lady pastor, and you're just like, yeah, yeah, they're gonna represent Christianity. You know, a lady bishop is gonna represent Christianity, or a homosexual minister is gonna represent Christianity accurately. Of course not. These are the people that are creeping in unawares, and the Bible says they were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, this is not the Calvinistic God chooses who is saved and who isn't. Because God, he doesn't choose who's saved and who isn't, right? We choose. But God, being God, he knows who is going to choose, right? Who, who is going to um, choose whether or not to believe on Jesus Christ or not. So he, in his foreknowledge, he sees who is going to believe on Jesus Christ or not. And he's already prepared a punishment for those people, right? So that's what that's referring to. Before of old, they were ordained to this condemnation. But he didn't make that choice for them. They made the choice, but he, he created the punishment. Now, one thing God did do, he did, he did create them. That I'll, that I'll give, you know, the Calvinists, right? In the sense that God knew, and I was talking about this with my brother, you know, God knew that certain people wouldn't believe, and yet he created them anyway, right? But it was them that rejected Jesus Christ. That's what you've got to understand. So they rejected Jesus Christ. So that's what's hard for us to grasp. What's hard for us to grasp is that God foreknows something that hasn't actually happened yet. You know, that's what I feel is difficult to grasp because God, God knows a choice and the choice somebody's going to make before they even make it. And we're trying to think, oh, how does that work? Because that person had every, every opportunity to believe like I did. Yet God already knew that they weren't going to believe even though they hadn't made that choice yet. So that, I don't know how that works, but you know, ultimately the responsibility of salvation lies on the person that rejected Jesus Christ and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is he going to remind them now? Now he's going to go to some Old Testament examples, right? Where he says, hey, here, here, are, pe here are some examples from the Old Testament of people that have turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denied the only Lord God. Now, what does he mean by denying the grace of our God and turning it into lasciviousness? What I believe that means is God's goodness. Like these, these examples that you'll see from the Old Testament, God has been so good to these people and yet they have rejected him, they've gone away from it and they've gone into wickedness. So he gives the first example. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not so what is that story that's the story where you know he was he, he saved them out of egypt first of all that great deliverance split the red sea he went through the red sea he fought for them in the battle you know he drowned the egyptians got them through that and then he's prepared them a land where the spies go in and they say hey this land is a land flowing with milk and honey this is the grace of god being good to them Right? But what did they do? They murmured. They complained. They didn't go in. Um, and, and we'll look at that story, I believe, in a second. I've got that. Uh, then there's the angels, right, which kept not their first estate. Now, I personally believe, uh, I've got these here. I'm just trying to remember which, which examples I put in. <clears throat> so that's uh, the people coming out of the land of Egypt. Now, verse number six is, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness 
unto the judgment of the great day. Now, I personally believe this is talking about, I don't have the verse in there, but in Genesis 6, where it talks about the sons of God, they saw the daughters of men and took them wives of all which they chose. I believe it's talking about that event because I think these three events are all events mentioned in the Bible. It wouldn't make sense if you have the people coming out of the land of Egypt, you have this random event that nobody knows about that you have to find, about, find out somewhere else in another book. And then you have Sodom and Gomorrah, which is in you know, Genesis 19. So I believe that verse 6 is referring to the story in Genesis 6 and, and they were angels. Now, th there's different theories out there. Or, you know, is, it, is it actually angels that became men? Is it men that are referred to as angels? I'm not so dogmatic about which theory it is. But all I know is that this verse, I believe, is referring to that story in, in, in Genesis 6. And what, what is the grace of God here? Well, obviously, they were in heaven. You know, if they were actually angels, I mean, they were in heaven. God was good to them, right? And then they left that grace of God and they went to fornicate with mankind. So that's what 6 is about. Now, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Because you say, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is very familiar, right? What was their sin? They're known for homosexuality, fornication. That was going on in that city, amongst other things as well. And then God, you know, visited that city to see, hey, was there actually anyone righteous there? He took a lot out. Why haven't any rain, fire, and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah to give us an example of what God thinks about ungodly fornication? But when you think about turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, because we know, what is lasciviousness? Lasciviousness is, you know, sexual lust, like, you know, sexual lewdness. That's what lasciviousness is. So when you think about Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah, they, they fit the lasciviousness. But then you think turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, what is that about? Well, the reason is, if you didn't know, Sodom and Gomorrah was a very blessed land. Right? It was, and this is how the Bible describes it. I've got the, the, the verses here in Genesis 13. If you remember the story of Abraham and Lot, right? They, they came out of Ur of the Chaldees and uh, Abraham was called out. Lot came with him, right? And then their herd men, because they, their cattle started to grow, their herd men started to fight, right? So, so Abraham says to Lot, you know, hey, I don't want strife between your herd men and my herd men, right? So it's better that we separate because we, it's too many of us to, 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 for in this land. So... So what he says to Lot is he says, you look up, you know, and you decide which way you want to go. If you go to the left, I'm going to go to the right. If you go to the right, I'm going to go to the left. So he gives Lot the choice, right, of where he's going to go. And he's just going to go the other direction. It's a very humble of Abraham because he was older, right? But, and he was the one, he was the prophet of God. And, but, um, you know, he gives Lot, his, his, um, his nephew, I believe his nephew off the top of my head, you know, the, the choice there. It says here, and Lot lifted up his eyes. So Lot's deciding where to go, right? And beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. So you see, he actually looks up, he actually chooses the better ground. If you think the well watered ground, if you're a herdman, you, you want rain, right? You want rain so it grows your grass, so you have food for your, for, for your livestock. It says here, well watered everywhere. Look at this, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So before he destroyed that land, it was actually a very blessed and very thriving land with a lot of rain. Look at this. Even as the garden of the Lord. So you see how blessed Sodom and Gomorrah was? He's saying, hey, it was even like the garden of Eden. That's, that's how good Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that plain of Jordan was. Like the land of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? That Egypt is likened to the Garden of Eden, saying hey, Egypt was a blessed land. That's another ungodly nation, right? The ones that, that put uh, uh, the, the children of Israel in bondage. As thou comest unto Zohar. So I just thought that was interesting. You're probably wondering, you know, hey, well, I can see saving people out of the land of Egypt. It's grace of God, you know. Angels, grace of God, because they're in heaven. But yeah, like Sodom and Gomorrah, no, Sodom and Gomorrah had the grace of God too, right? They, they were very, a very blessed land. Let's continue. Jude 8. And we'll, we'll go as far as we can. If, if I don't get through all Jude, we can continue next week. Jude 8. says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So this is where I think it's interesting. He, he, he's actually, these actually three examples are actually going back to the three examples that he gave. Right? Because you have these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Who's that? 
Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Despised dominion. What was that one? That was the angels that left their first estate, right? Because it's like they had somewhere they were meant to be and they left where they should have been, right? And speak evil of dignities. Now, what was that? When they saved them out of the land of Egypt, what's the speaking evil of dignities referring to, right? Uh, I, I, here's where I had Genesis 6. I can't remember what order I had these things in. Let's go to Numbers 14. Numbers 14 is where we see the story of the people actually speaking evil of dignities like the example that he gives after he saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward he destroyed them that believed not. What does that mean? That's when he destroyed them in the wilderness. He didn't let them go into the promised land anymore and they were made to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and that's the, the generation that didn't believe died out and then the next generation Joshua brought in. So this is in Numbers 14 when they're murmuring. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. Uh, so this is when the spies have come back out. And 10 of the spies are saying, yeah, it's a great land, but oh, the people are so big. We're like grasshoppers in their sight and discourage the people from obeying the Lord and going in to claim the land. And all the children of Israel, look at this. They murmured against Moses and Aaron. Now, who was it that told them to go and claim the land? It's God, right? So Moses and Aaron are just doing what God told them, but the people are murmuring against the people that are in charge, right? And the whole con congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness? So this is when they're talking about things they don't know. And wherefore had the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Right, so they've just been saved out of bondage. They've come out through the Red Sea. And now they're saying, hey, it's better actually for us to go back to where we were, right? And they said one to another, let us make a captain. Let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Look at this. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. This is the grace of God. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Look at this. So this is the speaking evil of dignities, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. So what is bade? Bade is the past tense of bid, right? bid is to ask right so they're basically they want wanting everyone to cast stones at them right bade to stone them with stones and the glory of the lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of israel and the lord said unto moses how long will this people provoke me how long will it be air look at this they believe me for all the signs which i have showed among them let's continue so in june 9 so that's the the three examples right so we had uh, who do we have we had the the speaking evil of dignities we had um, despising dominion, the angels, and then we had defiling the flesh, which was the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's continue in verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst, so durst is past tense of dare, right? He dared not. He dared not bring against him a railing accusation, so a false accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of things which they know not. So this is the example also of them that came out of the land of Egypt, right? They're speaking evil of Aaron and Moses and Caleb and Joshua. And they're saying things like, well, let's go back into Egypt where it was better. You know, this is like these people today. They're speaking evil. They speak evil against Christianity, but they don't even understand Christianity. Even the guy that Alex and I spoke to today, I was hoping I would get a chance to speak to him more. We spent a bit of time to him. But... You know, his main one was, you know, if, if God exists, why is he, why does he allow all this suffering? And that just shows, like, people, they, people he was an atheist, and, and people speak against things that they don't even understand. They don't understand why God allows suffering. They don't understand why there is suffering in the world, and things like that. They just think God should be a God that just is all good, right? Is all, is all no suffering, right? That's what they think. And that's what the Bible's saying here. Really, the people that are wicked in this world and they're railing against God, they're railing against dignities, they don't even always know what they're talking about. 
So here's where he's saying Michael the archangel. So there is a, a, an angel, Michael, who's a bit higher in, in, in um, authority amongst the angels. He, when he disputed with Satan, it's interesting, he disputed about the body of Moses. But when he disputed with Satan, he didn't even say something silly like these evil people do, like these wicked people. He just said, hey, the Lord is going to rebuke you, right? Rather than him making up some railing accusation. But what's this disputing about the body of Moses? You ever wonder, like, why, why, why is Michael fighting with Satan over the body of Moses? Right? And people have different theories, but if you didn't know in, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 34, nobody actually knows. I don't know if, if you caught this when you read through your Bible, but nobody actually knows where Moses' body is buried. Yep. Right? Why? Because here we read in Deuteronomy 34, Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. Now, if you don't know the story, just quickly, Moses was asked to speak uh, to hit a rock and the water gush forth to, 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 for the people to drink. The second time he was told to speak to the rock, right? And what did he do? He got angry. He said, here now, you rebels, much I fetch you water out of this rock. And then he, he strikes the rock the second time, right? So for that, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. He lost his temper with the people, but because he disobeyed God, he was still held accountable. He didn't give God that glory to speak to the rock. And Obviously, there's all different theories on why that is, right? Is it because the first time it was like Christ only suffered once for sin, but he sort of like did it the second time and went against God's picture of, you know, now it's like he just had to speak unto him to, to receive the blessing. So he hit the rock the second time, and because of that, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land, right? So this is at the end of Deuteronomy where before Joshua is about to take them into the promised land, God takes Moses up to the Mount Pisgah, to, he, he says to him, you're just going to see it, but you're not going to be allowed to go in. So this is where he is. He's at the top of the mountain. All in the Farley, all the land of Ephraim, Manasseh, all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea. And the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zohar. And the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Right? So that's, that's what we're reading here in Deuteronomy 34. This is why Moses wasn't allowed to go in. But look at this. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And look at this. And he buried him. So who buried Moses? God, God buried Moses. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if you guys ever caught that before. So in Deuteronomy 34, he takes him up to the mountain, shows him. Moses dies out there and God buries his body and it says here and he buried him in the valley in the land of moab over against beth peor but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day so he buried him i don't know what's happening with moses body but some how you know michael and this and satan are actually disputing about the body of moses right so satan for some reason is trying to get a hold of moses's body and some people believe it's because the two witnesses that return in the end times are likely going to be Elijah and Moses, right? So Moses' body probably plays a very significant part in the whole scheme of things. And maybe Satan was trying to do something with Moses' body, but Michael is there to protect Moses' body because it's going to be used in the end times, possibly. So I think that's interesting. If you never caught that in your Bible, you know, where, where God actually buried Moses and nobody actually knows where Moses was buried, that's how Deuteronomy ends there. Now, I think I'll end it there. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've just got to, I'm trying to think how much I've got left because I wanted to uh, go into next week these different stories. So Jude here, he says, he says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Corey. And this is what I'm saying. When you read through Jude, even though it's just one chapter, it's so like rich with different examples, right? Because Jude is using examples in the Old Testament to teach us a lesson of how people today will operate, right? How the wicked people today will operate. And if you understand these stories, you go back to the Old Testament and you see, you will understand Jude better. Whereas if you don't know your Bible that well, right, you'll read through Jude and you'll just be like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. <laughs> like, you'll read, like you'll read this, right? 
And this is why I wanted, that's why I thought it was an interesting passage because it's just like there's so much in it. But you read this here and you say, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So Cain, Cain is pretty, pretty famous for what he did, right? Ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. You may not be so familiar with what Balaam did. You know, who, who's Balaam, right? And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, if I tell you Balaam involved a talking donkey, maybe you, you know more about what Balaam did. Um, but the gainsaying of Kor Korah? Who's that? Right? So that's what, that's what I'll, I'll continue on in next week. I won't, I won't go in because then I'll feel like I'll, I'll rush the rest and, and we'll have a bit more time to fellowship. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Um, I just thank you as we, as we go through um, this, um, this chapter and we, and we look at the different examples. Lord, I pray that we'll get a better understanding of this epistle. And uh, Lord, help us to contend for the faith. Help us to be involved in the fight, to put on the spiritual armor and to know the word of God intimately to know it so that we can yield we can wield it as our weapon in this spiritual war and lord as we learn more about these wicked and ungodly people i pray lord that you would help us to to be ready to fight against these people lord and not to be scared we know how they operate lord we we know how they go about things and and lord ultimately they're they're often ignorant about what they know so i pray lord that you help us not to be ignorant so that we can be effective in this fight of faith. So I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the many examples and the many stories that you give us to, to teach us. And uh, Lord, I, I just pray that we would take these things to heart. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.